I have to say, I am thrilled and honored to be speaking to the New Haven Preservation Trust, but above all, to be talking to you in this magnificent meeting house of the Center Church. There, and you will see why, there literally could not be a more appropriate place for me to say what I'm about to say to you. And before I begin, one, one thing about that. It's my great good fortune to be married to Mary Woolsey, my wife who happens to be over here. And Mary is, how do I say it? Her, her grandmother's grandfather was the minister of this church. His name was Leonard Bacon. Uh, yes, you can applaud Leonard Bacon if you like. Uh, from 1825 until his death in 1881. Now the plaque to him is over there. And I, and I bring this up not out of enormous pride of family or connections or anything like that, though I, that's a reasonable thing. But for this reason, Mary's grandmother, who she knew as a child, was the granddaughter of Leonard Bacon. So a person in our audience today knew someone who knew someone who was born in 1802, right? And I raise that because even though, you know, we might think of New Haven as one of the oldest American cities, this church is one of the, the first churches founded by the English in North America, the time span is really quite short, right? The, the, the history of New Haven can be covered in not very many lifespans, right? Only three from Leonard Bacon's birth in, in Michigan in 1802 until today. Um, and so even though I'm in a sense talking about ancient history as far as America is concerned, it's still vital in living history in important ways. And I hope, I hope you'll see that as I go through the material. One other advance notice, maybe a, uh, it's not a um, spoiler alert, but if any of you has a kind of rectangophobia, a fear of squares, then I warn you, you are going to see a tremendous number of squares in this talk. So, so if that's a danger, now is the time to leave. But if you're okay with squares, then, you know, uh, get ready. The version of the nine squares that I want to talk about is not uh, that one, which is from an 18th century map but from this reconstructed version of the 1641 layout of New Haven. Uh, they're the same squares, but this one I think is, is easier to focus on in a lot of ways. So my talk is called Nine Squares in a Wilderness, Mysteries of Early New Haven. And there's a conventional version of this story of how there came to be nine squares in a wilderness. And it, it, it begins with the dramatic scene of John Davenport and Theophilus Eaton, the, the Puritan minister and the Puritan merchant from London, leading their flock to the land here near the mouth of the Quinnipiac River. And on the 24th of April, 1638, coming off the ships, and one historian, in fact, the historian who wrote the book on the left here, a fairly excellent but conventional history of New Haven, says that the place must have seemed more like a wilderness than Canaan to the colonists. And that day, John Davenport, depicted on the center there in, in uh, Isabel Calder's also excellent but fairly conventional book on this subject, Davenport preaches a text to his followers with a kind of wilderness theme. It's from Matthew 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led aside of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And his fellow minister, Peter Pruden, who had led a group of people from Hertfordshire as part of the community, also chooses a wilderness theme for his text. Uh, Matthew 3, verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And then, as the story goes from this exalted beginning, the Davenport and Eaton group proceed to lay out the new town as a very large square divided into nine smaller squares with the green set aside in the middle on which the church, meeting house, building, not this exact building, this is of course from the early 19th century, but this is the spot where that building would be built, a temple set in the wilderness. Okay, that's the conventional story, and it's true as far as it goes, 
but it's also deeply strange in some important ways. And in my talk tonight, I hope to explain to you what's strange about that version and to offer some suggestions for how to make better sense of the story. And to do that, I want to address three elements of that story, which will involve placing each of them in a much wider context of what happened when indigenous Americans and European colonists encountered one another here, of course, but in a, the more wider context of the 16th and 17th century exploration and colonization of the Americas. And so the three elements that I'm going to address are these. The first one, why did John Davenport and company imagine that Quinnipiac, this place, was a wilderness? That's why my title is in quotation marks. The second theme, why is it that no other town colonized by English Puritans in New England looked anything like New Haven? In other words, why the nine big squares? That's two. And then the third question, which I'll come to at the end, was why when the newcomers changed the name of this place from Quinnipiac, and that part's not strange, that is the English tended to change almost every Indian place name to an English place name where they colonized, but why did they call it New Haven? Where did that come from? So those are the three things that I'm going to address today, and I'm going to start right in with the first one, wilderness. So southern New England, prior to European colonization, when the Dutch, and then the English at Plymouth, and then at Massachusetts Bay, and then at uh, this area, Connecticut and New Haven, when those Europeans started arriving, this was no wilderness. In this map here, and it's hard to map indigenous spaces because the boundaries tended to be more, more flexible than European ones. But at the time of colonization in the region that you see on this map here, there were very likely somewhere between 50 or 75,000 indigenous people living in southern New England already. They were on the whole Algonquian language speaking, they were distributed into smaller bands or groups at times and persistently they have been called tribes, although that word has its problems. But as you see in this map, there were important groups all across the region, the Massachusetts, the Wampanoag, the Nauset, the Nipmuc in central Massachusetts, the powerful Pequot group in central Connecticut, and over here, uh, a smaller group of bands that were known as the Quinnipiac. They were farmers. They cleared and farmed fields and mixed their farming with occasional movements for hunting and fishing. They were engaged in trade and communications of all sorts with their neighbors, including at times quite distant relations. The fact that corn itself was grown here in New England meant that over the preceding centuries it had moved there from its origins uh, in Mexico. And as this next slide, oh, uh, in, in fact, shows is that this is an interesting map from a very good book on, on the history of farming in New England, which shows all these well-known English towns, familiar place names to us all, Weathersfield, Windsor, Springfield, and New Haven, of course. But all of these places were colonized by the English where they were, because these were all places where indigenous farmers had already cleared land. So that when English colonists arrived here, it was easy for them to figure out where good farmland was. It was already there. It had been farmed, in many cases, for a long time by indigenous people. In addition to the, the, the farming and the working of the land, the communications of uh, indigenous people in southern New England is represented on modern maps by maps like this uh, of trails, native trails that connected their settlements. This was made based on our knowledge of the early 17th century, the decades after 1600. And here's an inset from that map showing where we are now. Let's see if I can make this pointer thing work. Yes, it does. So if New Haven is here, well, Quinnipiac was a place where a series of important Indian trails coming from the east, 
from the west to a more northwesterly one, trails up towards what's now uh, Farmington and Hartford, all come together at Quinnipiac. In other words, this was a crossroads, this spot of Indian trade and communications where the Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac communicated with others. And so that's what I mean, why th this was not a wilderness. This was a well-settled, well-traveled, organized place of communication, trade, farming, etc. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the, the Quinnipiac. The Quin Quinnipiac were, of course, one of among uh, very many uh, different Algonquian bands. They spoke a language that was called Quiripoi. And the territory they occupied stretched roughly 20 miles or so across coastal Connecticut on either side of the Quinnipiac River and extending inland another 10 or 20 miles, depending on where you were. And around 1600, estimates are that there were probably three or 4,000 Quinnipiac people living in this region, divided up into at least three or four bands, of which there were kinship relations and connections among them, but settled in different places. Now, as far as European colonists in this region go, the Dutch came first. Henry Hudson sailed up the river that was later named after him in 1609. And by 1614, the Dutch outpost at what becomes New Netherland, New Amsterdam, uh, has traders like Adrian Block, after whom Block Island was named, trading with the Quinnipiac people in this region. In fact, there was already a Dutch name for this region in addition to Quinnipiac that Block and others used. Does anyone happen to know what that name was? It's exactly right. You people are well informed. I knew this audience would be, would be up to date. Yes, Rodeberg or Rodenberg, which means Red Mountain. They were referring to East Rock, right? That's, that's what the, the Dutch called this place name. So uh, that was an available name for the town. More on that later. In the 1620s and 30s, the Dutch trade through the whole Long Island Sound area expands rapidly. The Dutch want furs, and they get them from indigenous hunters and fur preparers, uh, hunters who work up the river valleys to find where the beaver are. And one of the important trade elements becomes that curious form of shells and shell strings and shell uh, belts that are known as wampum. Now, for the indigenous people of the region, wampum was not money. It was a, an important symbolic good. It was exchanged, but it was often exchanged in commemoration of negotiations, treaties of one kind or another, which might include the exchange of goods. So, for instance, if a particular Indian band was agreeing to allow a neighboring band to use its land for hunting in the following year, they might exchange a wampum belt in order to, to mark that, in part because wampum belts were strung in ways to create patterns that you could, in effect, read, that the particular pattern would be a commemoration of what had happened in that exchange. But when the Dutch saw this essentially diplomacy using these things that were often then sometimes in return exchanged for, for, for goods, like in return for a diplomatic treaty allowing hunting rights, the other tribe might give the first tribe something, furs or corn or, or whatever it was that was the consideration. The Dutch understood that as money. That is, they mistook the diplomatic side of this, the fact that, for instance, only certain members of an Indian band had the authority to exchange wampum in return for a treaty and assumed it functioned like European money did. And as soon as groups of people think something is money, it's money. And so the effect was that the Dutch begin trading wampum farther and farther through the region, beyond southern New England, up into Maine, up the Hudson Valley, and getting furs in return for it. And it creates an explosion in the demand for wampum. And so the Indians who are most accomplished at and most accustomed to making wampum are the Pequots along this part of southern New England, and their power grows rapidly because of it. 
And one of the things that the powerful Pequot tribe does is to start, demand, start to demand tribute payment from their neighbors. And so one of the problems that the Quinnipiac are facing in the 1620s and into the 1630s is that they are, to a certain extent, under the thumb of the more powerful Pequots to the east, having to give them tribute payments in money or furs or whatever the Pequots want. Right? So there's a, a power relation among the indigenous people that's going on before Davenport, etc., arrive. This becomes even more complicated when first the very tiny Plymouth colony develops in the 1620s, but then especially after 1630 when Boston is founded and Massachusetts becomes a competitor. Because Massachusetts, in terms of the population it brings to New England, is far bigger than Plymouth, far bigger than anything that the Dutch do. And yet it has this very constricted boundaries to its charter its northern boundary up by the Merrimack River, its southern boundary near the southern edge of the Charles. This line is at this point kind of fictive, but it defines as far south as Massachusetts goes. But as the 1630s are going on, as every year 1,000, 2,000 people are arriving in Boston, they're quickly realizing that there's not enough good farmland in the area around Massachusetts Bay for all of them. So by the middle years of the 1630s, people from Massachusetts are already coming into the Connecticut Valley and setting up towns like Wethersfield and Windsor and Hartford. They don't have any legal right to do that. They're beyond the bounds of the Massachusetts Charter, but they've figured out the land is better out there. And so essentially, they're doing it anyway. As a result of this growing population, of the increasing pressures that the Pequot expansion, the wampum explosion, the push for more furs ever farther inland, two devastating things happen. The first of them is that the movement of both Dutch and English colonists into the Connecticut River Valley, um, and the, in addition to to the English towns, the Dutch set up a, a trading post at near what, what's Hartford today, the House of Hope, they called it. This intrusion of Europeans brought unintentionally but devastatingly germs, diseases, which the Indians of Southern Connecticut had not been exposed to yet. And so a smallpox epidemic rages through this region in 1633-34. And as a result, we don't have obviously exact figures, but it's estimated that as much as 75% of the Indians in what's now Connecticut die from the smallpox epidemic. So those populations that might have been in the range of 40, 50,000 just in Connecticut alone are dramatically reduced. And the three or 4,000 Quinnipiacs from the region around here are among that. So by the time the Davenport Eaton group arrives in 1638, the remaining Quinnipiacs in the region are, are, are a small remnant of their former selves. That's one of the disasters. The other disaster is that in 1637, in a sequence of events that's way too complicated for me to uh, describe in this lecture, uh, th there's a major war centered around the Pequots and the Pequot dominance of southern New England. And essentially, these new colonists in Connecticut Plymouth colonists on the other side of Narragansett Bay and Massachusetts colonists combine, uh, combine with Indian opponents of the Pequots, like the Narragansetts. Um, and uh, the result for the Pequots is devastating. There's this uh, horrific scene in 1637. It's not easy to see, but it's on this map the, uh, where there's an attack on a, a Pequot settlement there in which hundreds of people are killed. And, and as a tribe, the Pequots are diminished and dispersed. Um, and that, to an extent, is good news to the Quinnipiac because the, the, the Pequot's ability to you know, press them for tribute payment and the like ends at the time. But at the same time, it, it's a horrific event in southern New England. So that's the context for the arrival of the 
uh, Davenport and Eaton group. Now let me say a little bit more about English colonization in advance of this. Well, actually there's that, uh, a couple of more words about the Pequots at the time. So, uh, and, and while I'm at it, I wanna offer some much deserved praise to the author of what, as far as I can tell, is really the best work on the history of the Quinnipiac Indians in this region. Uh, it was a man by the name of John Menta, who as a master's thesis at Southern Connecticut State University in 1994, produced really a book-length treatment of the subject, which enormously informed uh, my understanding of this. Sadly, he died right at the time he was submitting his thesis. Uh, it was published afterwards by a Yale anthropological series, but this, this slide is borrowed from it. Essentially, the, there were four bands remaining when Davenport et al. arrived. There was this one, uh, the Mamaguin Band, which was on the eastern side of the harbor in, I guess, what's now East Haven. That was the, the largest of them. A second one was headed by another headman named Mantoese that was north of East Rock, where the road still today is named after him. On the far eastern edge of the territory, where Guilford is now, there was a, a, a female leader of, of the band there, uh, a woman by the name of Shampishu. And then finally, there was a last band in what's now Branford uh, that was led by an elderly uh, chief or head na man named Quasaquanch at what was called Totoket. So those were the sort of four main settlements in the region of the Pequots and uh, of the Narragansett, of the, sorry, the Quinnipiac. Uh, and, and those are the people who are there when the Davenport group arrives. So now I want to talk a little bit about the precedents in terms of the laying out of towns, cities, and villages that lay behind the English colonization of the Americas generally and of New England in particular. And the first thing that you need to know is that English colonization of the Americas was first and foremost a profoundly anti-Spanish project. Spain was the great enemy of 16th century of Elizabethan England. You probably know the stories of the Elizabethan sea dogs as they were called. Uh, um, Francis Drake and Walter Raleigh who captured Spanish treasure ships and brought the fortunes home to Queen Elizabeth. And so much of the English interest in colonizing the Americas came from a desire to plant colonies there so that they could either attack the Spanish more easily or find the same kind of treasure in gold and silver in North America that the Spanish had found in Central and South America. And so as an example, I put this slide up. At the same time that Puritans are founding Massachusetts in New England, again, the hopes of finding gold and silver there, another group of English Puritans, led by members of the nobility, is planting a colony in the heart of the Spanish Caribbean at a little island that they called Providence Island, near the coast of Central America, near all of these Spanish strongholds like Cartagena and Havana, with the idea that this will be an English entry into the Spanish world and a place that they can launch attacks on the Spanish. Now, from Massachusetts, you weren't going to launch attacks on the Spanish, but the hope was you could find rich, valuable things to make the colony a competitor to the wealth of Spain. And so that's part of what's going on in the colonization of New England. Now, of course, I'm sure you know, it also has a religious purpose to promote Protestantism in the New World, just like the Spanish colonies were trying to promote Catholicism in the New World. And here, of course, is the, the great seal of Massachusetts with the kind of stylized figure of an Indian. People in Europe knew that Indians did not look like that, did not wear like bundles of leaves around their middle. But nonetheless, it's, a, it, it's, it's supposed to be an image of an Indian saying the words, come over and help us. <laughs> now, don't think that that only means they thought Indians were poor, weak beings who needed help. It's a biblical quotation. It comes from the book of Acts, and it comes specifically from the dream that St. Paul has while he's still in Asia of a man from Macedon in Europe 
who comes to him in a dream and says in the dream, come over and help us. And so this became the Massachusetts symbol because similarly the, the leaders of Massachusetts are thinking, oh, the people in this other new continent, not Asia to Europe, but now Europe to America, need our help in spiritual terms just the way that the Romans did and the Greeks did way back in the days of the Bible. So this is a kind of uh, visual embodiment of the, of the missionary purposes that they had in mind uh, in, in the founding of the colony. Now, when it came to laying out towns in Massachusetts, which of course precedes the New Haven colony, this is why I said earlier, they don't look like New Haven does. Here, for instance, is London from around this time, from 1593. And this is where John Davenport and Theophilus Eaton came from. And in particular, they came from the tangled, gnarly streets in the eastern part of London near, near Cornhill, the Merchants' Row, because a lot of the members of their congregation were merchants. And this was no neat nine large laid out squares. This was old London in all of its uh, smoke and twists and turns. So the idea of New Haven did not come from there. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Boston, probably all of you. This was the Boston in which Davenport and Eaton and their group of Londoners arrive in 1636, and it is not nine big squares either. That is, the founders of Boston took the peninsula and followed its shapes and contours and laid out the roads through it in places that made sense to them in terms of creating uh, an effective settlement. So this was not the source either. And if you look at uh, the inland towns, the farm towns of Massachusetts at the time, you, you won't find it there either. This is a, a later reconstruction of what Sudbury, a, a, a village about 20 miles west of Boston, looked like in the 17th century. And there too, it's the same thing. The Sudbury River runs through it and they lay out their strips of uh, house lots and farmlands and commons and the like in, according to the terrain and whatever places work best for the purposes they're looking for. So, in other words, creating rectilinear square towns was not part of English tradition. It's not something that the Puritans in Massachusetts were trying to do. So the question then is, why? Why are the founders of New Haven deviating so radically from their own past and from the kinds of things that their fellow Puritans are doing just a few miles to the north in Massachusetts? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. What's pushing the settlement of New Haven itself are the things that I've talked about already. The waves of migrants, the rapid population growth in Massachusetts, the lack of f farmland there, the realization that Long Island Sound and Southern Connecticut are, are, are very uh, attractive places. And so Davenport and Eaton are among one of these waves, and so are their fellow Londoners who come with them. But they meet up with, uh, let me see what I have next here. Yeah, I'm gonna save that for a second. Uh, they, they, they meet up with other migrants to Boston at the time. There are groups that had come from Yorkshire in the north of England. There are groups that came from Hertfordshire, just north of London. And they go first to Boston, but by the time they get there, the fact that people are already leaving Massachusetts Bay and coming to places like Hartford and Wethersfield and the like convinces them early on that they too should spread out to find better territory. And the thing that drew their attention to this place, to Quinnipiac, to the, to the harbor and the Quinnipiac River, was that war against the Pequots. Because in the aftermath of it, English soldiers from Connecticut and Plymouth who are pursuing and chasing down people they see as their Pequot enemies, came west along the coast and saw this region, saw it was relatively, at this point, underpopulated with Indians, and the information comes back to Boston that that might be a good place for a new settlement. So that's why uh, um, Davenport and his group arrive here in April of 1638 in their ships. So the nine squares doesn't come from their English background or experience. 
And yet the striking thing, and, and I guess this is the, the second mystery, is that it's the dominant form in Spanish America. So what you see here is a plan of one of the very early towns, a decade after Columbus sailed the ocean blue, Santo Domingo on the island of Hispaniola, today the D Dominican Republic. And look how Santo Domingo was laid out in 1502, a square in the middle with a church and then squares around it, more than nine, but nonetheless, a pattern that looks a whole lot more like here than anything in the English background. Was it just Santo Domingo? No, it was not just Santo Domingo. Here is Mendoza in Argentina, far from Puerto Rico, 60 years later, 1562, and that's looking rather familiar here with the church and its square in the middle and the blocks around it. Here's Cusco in Peru in the Andes a few years later, and here, here is Caracas in Venezuela in 1578, and there's your same square, right? Uh, on the shore on the edge of, edge of the Amazonian jungle, the foundational plan of Buenos Aires, even 14,000 feet up in the Andes at the giant silver mountain of Potosi. When they lay out a Spanish city there, they lay it out in the same square pattern. By the time, oops, that's too far. By 1573, King Philip II of Spain, an emperor of this giant empire, decrees that this is how all Spanish towns in the Americas have to be set out. This is what he says in his decree. A plan for the settlement is to be made, dividing it into squares, streets, and building lots, using cord and ruler, beginning with the main square from which the streets are to run to the gates and principal roads and leaving sufficient open space so that even if the town grows, it can always spread in the same matter. And basically what he was doing in 1573 was ratifying and putting into law what was already the practice for 70, 80 years before then. So, and as these slides suggest, whether it's high in the mountains or you know, on the coast by the jungle, it didn't matter. The terrain was not what was determining this. Spanish cities in the Americas were going to be rectilinear grids squares built around temples and civic spaces in the center, and that was the law. So am I saying that the Puritan founders of New Haven were imit imitating their mortal enemies? The Catholic Spanish rulers of the enormous empire to the south? Well, it looks awfully like it, but like most things in history, it's not so simple. Rather, what's going on here is that both the Spanish through the 16th century in their own religious mission in transforming the Americas and the Puritans who come to New England very late, right, in the 1620s and 30s, they're both influenced by a common source of inspiration, by a similar set of ideas about the relationship between the Bible and biblical history and its prophecy and the ideals for human society, a, a set of ideas that are inspired by Christianity that transcend the sharp and violent divide between Protestants and Catholics of the 16th century. It's a tra tradition that we might call Christian utopianism. So now I can show you my secret next slide. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, in the 1590s, a Spanish member of the Jesuit order, a Spanish uh, cleric by the name of Juan Bautista Villalpando, wrote an interpretation of the Old Testament book of Ezekiel and published it. And Ezekiel, of course, you'll all remember, was the prophet who, during the captivity of the Israelites in Babylon, after the destruction of the first temple, had a vision of rebuilding Solomon's temple, the second temple, after the Israelites could come back. And so, Villalpandus, in his book about this, included images, pictures, that depicted the temple in Jerusalem. And also, ones that depicted the encampment of the 12 tribes of Israel around the Ark of the Covenant 
during their wanderings after leaving Egypt on the way to Canaan. And another one depicting Ezekiel's vision for the second temple. And if you look at these images, you will note a familiar pattern. This is the Ark of the Covenant, a sacred space object surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight squares with the ninth in the middle. Huh. Ezekiel's temple, more or less the same thing. Two squares go to the, the, the temple and these others around it, but that pattern should look familiar to you all by now. This is what I meant about squarophobia. That this, uh, but yeah, so this is one of the things that is lying beneath the decrees of the Spanish government and church that this is how Spanish cities in the Americas should look. The idea behind this interpretive tradition was that these Old Testament examples or models were, were types, that was the word that was used, typology for perfect societies according to God's divine plan. And that even though these were ancient examples, they continued to be valid examples into the future and especially for the instruction and conversion of people not yet exposed to Christianity. And also perfect places to organize the ways of life for those people who saw themselves as the chosen of God, as the successors to the children of Israel. So another example of this sort of thing, more squares. Another Catholic priest, this one from the Low Countries, from Belgium, by the name of Christian van Adrichem, in the 1590s produced another lovely book. This is a kind of historical account of Jerusalem, in, which included this gorgeous map of Jerusalem, again featuring Solomon's temple in the center. And so that you don't think that this is something that only the sort of rarefied reading public who could buy expensive books were interested in. There was at this very same time, oops, uh-oh. Uh, I don't know whether I say okay or not. This is bad. Uh, oh, goodness. Okay, it'll come back. It better. <laughs> yeah, okay, I think I just have to do that. Okay, I must have said something wrong, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, to, so it's not just like people who can afford the most expensive books and are highly literate. At the same time, in the south of England, in towns like Dorchester and all, there was a busker, uh, a kind of street entertainer, who had a wheelbarrow. And on the wheelbarrow had built a scale model of Jerusalem and covered it over with a cloth. And he would walk around from village to village. And if you paid him, you know, a few pennies, he would take the cloth off and you could see the model of Jerusalem, of the heavenly city that ideally, you know, saved Christians would someday inhabit. And maybe if the Reformation went in all the right directions, someone would be able to build on earth. So this is a popular tradition. It's not just uh, for the elites. I'm going to give you one more version of this because it wasn't just a Catholic one as far as the, the sort of high theological learning version, but there were, there were Protestants following this tradition too. And one of them was a German Protestant whose name was Johann Valentin Andriai, kind of mystical thinker, wide publisher. And in 1619, now we're getting right into the time period that we're talking about, he published a utopian text called A Description of the Republic of Christianopolis, that is a, an imaginary ideal Christian city. And in that text, of course, he too had his images of what it should look like, and what do you know? It's another one of these squares. That's a sort of perspective view. Here's what it looked like from overhead. I don't know how well you can read the captions, but it's the same deal. Temple with civic center in the middle. College around it. Uh, garden of Physics, Apartments for the Town Dwellers. Now this one has a wall around it. And part of the reason for the wall is that by 1619, the Thirty Years War has broken out in Europe and there would now be another 30 years of intense military hostility between Catholics and Protestants. So it's no surprise that a vision of an ideal city 
1619 is going to be a city with walls around it. But nonetheless, by now, I think you should see the pattern is clear that for both Catholics and Protestants, there was a powerful belief that ideal cities should be built this way. Now this fellow, Johann Valentin Andriai, was friends with other German reformer theologians named Samuel Hartlib and Jan Comenius. And during the Thirty Years' War, they fled the danger of Europe and moved to England, to London in particular. And John Davenport, Puritan minister at St. Stephen's uh, Coleman Street in London, becomes good friends with Samuel Hartlib. Uh, and is clearly inspired by them and in fact demonstrated his debt to the Christian utopian tradition, this biblical typology, thusly. Here's a, a quotation from one of John Davenport's writings at the time. He writes, you have to listen carefully to this, it's a little obscure. He writes, nor might Solomon, though the wisest of mere men, act by his own wisdom in the building of the temple, but he was guided therein by the perfect pattern which David gave him from the Spirit of God. So, concerning Christian churches, Christ has given his people a perfect pattern according to that prophecy in Ezekiel 43, 10, 11, and according to the measure of the golden reed or rod whereby the city and the gates and the dimensions of the New Jerusalem are measured. Right? So John Davenport was fully imbued with this way of thinking about biblical typology and the way it gave perfect patterns for how Christians ought to live. That's where the nine squares comes from. So when Davenport and company come to New Haven, to this already cleared farmland, they set this up according to the models of the Temple of Ezekiel, according to the models of the encampments of the Israelites in the wilderness, right? That's where the wilderness idea comes from. It's not because this was a wilderness. It's because Davenport and people who thought like him needed it to be a wilderness. It was the language they had from the Bible, from their understanding of the experience of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was a creative blend made by Davenport and the circles that he moved in before migrating to America of English Puritan ideas about returning to the churches of the apostles in the early days of Christianity, but blended with this deep pool of Renaissance Christian learning about Old Testament details as exemplars for how God's chosen people would live. And finally, it's designed this way in the hopes of becoming or at least aligning themselves with the new Jerusalem promised in the book of Revelations and in the hope that this model for living will have a positive effect on indigenous people in America to learn to live in these terms as well. Right? So it's an extraordinary intellectual vision, but it's taking advantage of the fact that it was not a wilderness but rather that they're planting in a place where people had lived for thousands of years and occupying uh, an already active, though much recently diminished and damaged society. They are, in effect, thinking themselves into biblical history and its protracted future. And in that sense, those thoughts overcame their ability to actually experience the world that they were seeing. They wanted it to be a wilderness, and so it was, even though by anything they might have seen when they came here, it was not. All right, quickly, my last question. Why did they choose the name New Haven? Weirdly, for almost every other English, you know, English settlement in New England, Dedham, Boston, Plymouth, on and on, I could tell you why. It's pretty clear. In most cases, it's because a formidable part of the English colonists who came and called their town Dedham or whatever came from a place in England that was called that. It was a sort of transfer. And interestingly, when they did that, they almost never used the word new. New London is a, is a, a, a counterexample to what I'm saying, but almost every other place, they didn't say new Boston or new Dedham or new Sudbury. They just called it 
Boston, the way the town in Old England was called. So why did they call this place New Haven? Well, there is a smallish town in England called New Haven on the south coast in Sussex, I think. But nobody who settled here in the Davenport group was from that New Haven. And in fact, I don't know how well you can see in this slide, but on the top here, on what would have been the west side, there were two areas laid out beyond the nine squares. One's called the Hertfordshire Quarter, and one is called the Yorkshire Quarter. This was farmlands being reserved for the people in the group who were from Yorkshire and Hertfordshire, but they didn't call the town Hertford or York, right? even though there were a lot of people from, from there. In all of the histories that you might look up, like the ones I showed earlier, more recent ones, there's speculation about why New Haven, but there's no solid evidence. So I'm going to offer a theory that I can't say is any better than the others, but I like it. And so I'm going to leave you with that. The reason I think this place was called New Haven has everything to do, again, with John Davenport's background. But this brings it much closer. Because one of his closest friends and one of his mentors in the Puritan movement was a man named John Cotton, who was the minister of the First Church in Boston, who came to Boston in 1633, a really powerful figure. And John Cotton had been the minister of the church in the town of Boston in England, the old Boston. And that's why the new Boston was named that. It was in honor of him, who one of the most important preachers in the whole Puritan movement. And in fact, when John Cotton was suspected by the king and the archbishop of uh, you know, violating Church of England rules, which he had been doing, it was John Davenport who hid him in London until they could sneak him on a ship that could get him to the colonies. The two of them were that close. So here's my theory. John Cotton, as I said, came from the town of Boston in Lincolnshire in Old England. In fact, he was a minister at this church. It's the largest non-cathedral church in all of England, the St. Botol's Church in Boston. And it was right on the water, on the river Witham. But curiously enough, even though it was a port town and became very rich in the Middle Ages as a place exporting wool to the European continent, it wasn't on the coast the way Boston in Massachusetts is. I don't know how well you can see this. I'm going to try to point it out with my little pointer here. There it is. As you can see, that's it. It's some distance from the coast. And the river, where, river with them. The river with them comes down here through the town of Lincoln and comes to Boston. But because of the peculiarity of the land in this region, it kind of stops. It doesn't flow all the way to the sea. This was the area of England called the Wash. Very marshy, there were odd uh, geographical configurations. I'm not clever enough to explain them. But in order to make Boston a port, there had to be something that connected it to the, the North Sea, the ocean there. If you look at this, a close-up view of another map, okay, so here's Boston. There's the connector. So the river, ri, ri, I can't say river with them. The river with them stops around here. It's met by another one. But then this other connecting channel, which they had to keep dredging so it wouldn't silt up and be unpassable, is the thing that makes Boston into a port. And in fact, it's still there today. It looks like that. And it is called the Haven. That is the name for that body of water that connected Boston to the sea. And since I can't find any other connection between any of the colonists here and any place in England, I speculate, I have no, I can't, don't tell anybody that I said this, right? Don't bet on it in a bar, anything like that. But this is my guess, that New Haven may have been named in honor of John Cotton in the hope that this place, and this was the hope of the merchants who settled it, would become the same kind of commercial powerhouse for New England that Boston and England was for Old England. So I'm going to stop right there because I have no more to say on this subject, but I, it's been a thrill for me to address you all on this, and I'm happy to take, I can't say I can answer them, but I'm happy to take any and all questions that you have. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>
This gentleman in the front had a question before I was even done. So, sir, yes. First question was, uh, where did you get that marvelous tie? No, <laughs> you made more squares, right? No, the first question was, um, uh, when was New England first called New England, right? How did that much larger name get applied? And the second one, why didn't anyone else sort of come up with the kind of elaborate plan that the Davenport group did for New Haven? Uh, excellent questions. So, interestingly, this region had been referred to as New Haven as early as the early years of Virginia. In fact, one of the first places you see it is in the map of the Atlantic coast that Captain John Smith of Virginia fame makes in a book that he writes in the 16 teens about the prospects for European colonization generally. It was a name that was in use in other ways as well. So the way that colonies were sort of authorized by the crown in these early decades of the 17th century was that the king set up a, a kind of council or a committee of aristocrats, major figures in the government, to whom he sort of gave the job of figuring out like who to give land grants to and in what way and how much. And so by the 16 teens, and I don't know whether it was connected to, to John Smith's writings or not, that group was called the Council for New England. But its purview wasn't just what we would call New England. It was for like a council for a New England in the Americas. And that's the group that granted Virginia its charter in 1606 and 7. And then it's the same group that gave Massachusetts and others their, their dinky little charters much later. So the, the word is out there, but it, it takes time for it to be. And, and the other reason that I think this particular region was called that much more so than the more southerly ones is that in terms of climate and agricultural potential and even the rivers and the terrain, I think people felt this was more like England in this region than the more southerly areas. Now the second question, uh, which was why, why the Davenport group? Again, we don't have like uh, concrete literary evidence to this, so this is me speculating again. But I think it probably has to do with the fact that the Davenport, Eaton, London Merchant Group, among all of the 20,000 or so colonists who come to the Americas, they're wealthier on average. They have more money, more means in coming. Second, they're late, right? The, the Mass Bay project has been going on in one form or another since the 1620s. And they're arriving at sort of the height of the wave of colonization when the colonies to the north are already doing pretty well. Like they're not starving anymore. They're, they're reasonably well established. It looks like this project is going to work. And then finally, I think one of the, so they sent scouts out here the year before in 1637. And I think the fact that they had this lovely harbor and river coming down and already cleared land gave them an opportunity together with their, you know, sort of advanced resources compared to most to actually put something into practice that was not necessarily, they weren't necessarily the first people to think of this, but rather they're the first people who could actually do it, right? That's my, that's my guess about it. That's why I see, but again, I, I couldn't demonstrate that with evidence, because as far as I know, there isn't any. But excellent questions. Thank you. So I think one of the problems with this plan, as compared to Boston or Sudbury, or, uh, the squares are too big, right? They're, they're, they're too big for the kind of society that the colonists of New England are actually able to generate. The, so like the center one, the one that we are right now in the middle of, they were using these measures from like Solomon's temple in which they were supposed to be, I'm forgetting the exact number now, X number of cubits or whatever. But what that meant was that each of the squares was something like, now I'm sure I'm gonna say the wrong thing, but something like 300 yards on each side. Right, they were really quite large, and if you compare them to like the town commons in New England towns all over the region, which I'm sure many of you know, 
they're bigger, right? But they weren't commons. The commons were going to be outside the squares where you could keep your cows or glean wood or whatever. It was supposed to be just civic space. Certainly the center square was. And you're right, the ones surrounding it are definitely supposed to be property, as they were in the Spanish ones and essentially as they were in like these biblical models too. But it takes a very long time for them to fill in. And part of the reason is that the promise, the hope of New England is a great merchant center and it doesn't really work out very well. The Quinnipiac River was disappointing. It's not navigable very far into the interior the way the Connecticut was. And so it wasn't a good place to draw the produce of the whole region and become a port for it. The river was better for that. Boston turns out to be better for that. So economically, New Haven in the 17th century is kind of a disappointment. And so it takes a very long time for those squares to fill in. And uh, this doesn't fully get it, but you know, they chose a spot that was big enough to put the squares. There's some speculation that even its position relative to these creeks that aren't there anymore, but were at the time, it was based on biblical models. I, I'm not sure whether that's true or not. But by putting it where it did, it kind of distanced the town from more advantageous places for wharfs and commerce and things like that. It was like choosing an awkward spot. And when, you know, people, farmers, uh, tradespeople or whatever, they tended to follow their interests, whether for good farmland or a good place to have a, a tannery or a mill or something like that. And so there was, from early on, a tendency to ignore the squares, right, to go beyond it and find places to do what you wanted to do. And so for that reason, outside the squares, rather quickly, you get streets not going in straight lines from the nine squares, we're bending off towards this, that, or the other place that was, was going to be useful or worthwhile. And so as a result, you know, uh, the most commercially effective parts of it were on the edges, like what becomes State Street. Uh, and then the city itself over the decades and centuries makes more land, landfill and the harbor and wharves and things like that, and sort of moves away from the squares for many of its commercial purposes. I'm not a great expert on 19th century New Haven, but when you look at maps of 19th century New Haven or the places where there's industry and commerce and that sort of thing, it's moved away from the square, right? So I, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but there's a way in which the, the ideal, as grand as it was, didn't turn out to be a very successful way of actually laying out a colonial city compared to a Boston or the like. Sir. Uh, you're speculating on uh, why this layout didn't uh, go to other parts of the state. Uh, I'm originally from Enfield, and uh, a stone's throw from what is now Bradley International Airport. Sure. And that was put there because uh, it was the flattest place in the whole state of Connecticut because it had been a, uh, uh, a lake bottom many, many years ago mm -hmm. um, after the last glacier. Now, I would assume, maybe I'm wrong, that similarly, uh, this area is relatively flat. Mm -hmm. uh, you drive all over Connecticut and there's a lot of hills and it would be difficult to put something of this scale mm -hmm. on in other parts of the state. That's my expectation. Oh, I think you're, you're completely right, yeah. I mean, you literally could not have put this on the Shawmut Peninsula where Boston was. It's just, you know, <laughs> people would be up on the mountain, people would be in the water. Right, so I, I do think, and, and this is why I reiterate, re, reiterate the idea, that the Quinnipiac world was not a wilderness when they arrived. It was already cleared farm land. The various bands of the Quinnipiac knew this was a good place to do what they were already doing. So yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, one of the advantages of this plan was that, you know, so there was this sort of church and meeting house civic square in the middle. And then the idea was, yeah, everyone is going to live around here, and those people are going to farm, or will farm in fields around the edges of it. And so the idea of a compact settlement, where everyone was near the important stuff that was happening and close to the harbor, that was pretty popular, right? The, the, the thing that made it a, a sort of strange 
setup, I think, was the scale of it for a brand new community. But uh, yeah, so it's a great question, but I, I, I have not ever seen any evidence that there were disgruntled early New Havenites saying, we wish we hadn't done this stamp square. Yes. N knowing what we know about the history of European indigenous relations over the long term, it, it's tempting to think that, but I wouldn't, so I wouldn't underestimate the sincerity of the commitment represented in that come over and help us seal of Mass Bay, uh-oh. Uh, um, I, I put this back up again because the very first thing that Davenport, Eaton, et cetera, do is go around and meet with Mama Gwyn and Montueze and Champichu and make arrangements with them for their permission in return for goods to occupy some of this land and guarantee that these now much reduced bands will continue to have their land and be able to have hunting grounds beyond their land, right? So it's not as if their behavior is suggesting that they want to, you know, wish away these people, but also, um, th that image that come over and help me is sort of reflecting a powerful moment in the history of Christianity when it moves from Asia to Europe and is the beginning of the Christianization of all of Europe. And the people who are being converted in Europe are heathens, pagans, whatever, worshipers of you know, Jupiter and whatever, who then become Christians. And so I, I, I'm, I'm not ready to discount the idea that the Massachusetts Bay, the New Haven, et cetera, people sincerely hoped that they too would convert the peoples of the Americas into Christians like them. Now, of course, that in and of itself is a whole lot of baggage of one kind or another. But I, I, that one's a tricky one. So I, I get what you're saying, and there's a, a wilderness talk goes on and on and on in just the ways that you're talking about. But I, I don't actually think that they were sort of wishing them away. Yeah. And the other thing is the Quinnipiac, as far as we can tell from the surviving evidence, were reasonably happy that this smallish group of rich English people came because it's new trading partners, it's you know something that can keep them going given their really diminished state after the, the smallpox epidemic, and it's potential protection for them against other threats from their indigenous enemies of one kind or another. So. That, that's part of the story, too. Absolutely. Savannah and before that, Philadelphia, right? And what those have in common is that they are later uh, iterations or additions of similar kinds of ideas that have transformed in the subsequent decades, right? So Philadelphia is founded by Quakers, which is a radical sect of uh, the Puritan movement, radical in the sense that they uh, well, I'm not going to try to do Quaker theology, but <laughs> they certainly took inspiration from some of the same kinds of sources that Davenport and the like were reading, although moved them in different directions. So their own ideas for why they wanted a grid city had changed by the 1680s. And similarly, Savannah is a British not religious utopian project so much, although Oglethorpe, the leader, was a, a devout uh, Anglican of his time, but it too was a reform project, the idea that we can make a better kind of city. Um, and among the things that they do there are settle all of these German refugees, Protestants, fleeing from the persecution of the Catholic Archbishop of Salzburg there. So it, things have changed in a century in the way people think about it, but there's continuity in this idea that, well, you know, there's something to these kinds of cities as better ways to live than just sort of higgledy-piggledy. We shouldn't, like, congratulate ourselves into thinking that New Haven was the wonder of the world after this point. It, it, it was a pretty sleepy place, right? I mean, so, uh, and, I, and again, since there's so many models of this, and including the entire Spanish world and whatever, it, you didn't have to look to New Haven to be able to think of these ideas. But there's certainly other cases that, that grid patterns come forward. And, and you know, 
there's a whole architectural tradition in the Roman secular world, this fellow Vitruvius who has ideas about rectangles and squares and city planning and all. So it's not like this is the only possible way to get to uh, a sort of rectilinear grid for a city, but it is the way that Davenport and, and his fellows here did it. So great question though. Yes, way in the back. Well, there was a wayer in the back, but <laughs> I'll, get to, I'll get to you both, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it is true that there are cities throughout New England that probably to some extent because of what you were suggest someone was suggesting about just the, uh, you were the sort of adaptability of the land to a plan like that, and, and there, there are obvious utilities to rectangles and squares, you know, you can plot out the who gets what land pretty easily there. Yeah, so there, there certainly are, but you're, you're right that none of them have the, the grandiosity or the vision that the New Haven version did. Yeah, yeah. well, it, it, it's a, an interesting question, and there actually have been people who've written about New Haven history who have suggested that. I just don't see anything in the experience of the people who did it, Davenport, Eaton, etc., that would connect them to that tradition. Where it's, where it's very clear that, you know, um, Davenport is friends with Samuel Hartlib, Comenius, Andrei, who are pushing this kind of model, and in his own writings and in his correspondence with Hartlib, the quotation that I read in which he's saying, yeah, Ezekiel, yes, the New Jerusalem, yes, the, the tribes in the desert. So that's what I'm saying. I, I'm not trying to argue that Anywhere you go throughout the world, when you find a city on a grid pattern like that, it comes from New Haven or it comes from this Puritan or Christian utopian tradition, right? There, there are many strains in the globe's history of how cities come to the way they look. But I, but I am pretty sure that the version that New Haven can, had or has came from that Christian utopian tradition, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, so what, what Bruce was just uh, relating was the way in which Davenport's friends' correspondence among these European, in his case mostly, Protestant reformers, you know, they, they, they're living in these both incredibly frightening and difficult but also ecstatic times where there's a lot of apocalyptic speculation, belief that this sign or that sign of the end times is near and, you know, the second coming could be soon and the new Jerusalem really will appear on the earth and maybe we should get ready for it. And that's the case among Davenport and his group. And, and it's certainly the case that part of the mission spirit of colonization has to do with biblical prophecy that the gospel has to go around the world and all of the heathen have to hear it and the converted have to be gathered in for this to happen. And so, yes, the idea that these squares will help in that process, it will convince indigenous people that this is the true way and they'll be brought in and that this could be, you know, where the new Jerusalem in America will appear, all of that is there, right? It's there also among London merchants thinking, yeah, if we go there, we'll have good access to the fur trade and make a lot of money sending the material for hats back to England. That those two things aren't separate. Um, and you don't you have to think they're one or the other, but it's, it's absolutely part of the theological world of, of Davenport and his colleagues. And, and yes. Oh, so good. Uh, uh, how successful was Davenport in uh, converting Quinnipiac Indians? And, and the answer is not very. Other New England clergymen made far more strenuous and serious efforts along these lines. The foremost of them was John Eliot, who uh, was the minister in Dorchester, I'm sorry, Roxbury, outside of Boston, but was the principal figure doing two things. One, organizing dozens of Indians into towns on an English model, which were called praying Indian towns. And then secondly, leading a team of people who translated the entire Bible into the Massachusetts language, which was then published in Boston. And the mission in those towns was to teach indigenous people to read these Bibles in their own language. 
right? So, so there are major efforts going on in, you know, from Boston out into central Massachusetts. Davenport was not that connected to those people. So in, in that sense, maybe he thought the simple <laughs> grandiosity of the town, would, I, I don't know. D Davenport didn't leave much in the way of writings about Indian relations the way a lot of these others did, but it's a good question. <laughs> 